Ever since October 7th, the topic we have covered more than any other by a decent distance on this show is the ongoing war that is carried out by Israel against a largely uh, helpless population in Gaza. Whatever you think of the original justification for the invasion and the attack itself, this is not really a war in any classical or traditional sense. It's not a combat, any combat between two militaries the way, say, is happening in Ukraine and happens in most combat and theaters that we refer to as a war. This is really an attack by a country with one of the most sophisticated militaries in the world, backed by the world's largest superpower, Israel and the United States, that is bombing and invading and shooting and shelling and blockading a population that is almost entirely civilian and that has no real military to speak of. They had very primitive rockets that they aimlessly have shot into Israel as a protest against the two-decade blockade. They obviously have some guns and some other uh, small munitions, but they have no military to speak of. And as a result, it's not any kind of a real war. It's a massacre. It's a very one-sided conflict. And one of the things that happened very early on in the war was that the Israeli government at the highest level, in fact, its defense minister, Yoav Gallant, said what Israel's plan would be for the war, one of the weapons they intended to use against the Palestinian people, not against Hamas, but against all of Gaza, which was a full-scale blockade where they would deliberately exclude food, water, electricity, or fuel from entering Gaza. They didn't say, we're not going to provide them with fuel and water and food. They said, we're going to block all of Gaza from getting from any source, from, from other countries, from international aid organizations, food and water. And he said it on video, and everybody can listen to it, and we're about to listen to it right now. Here is the Israeli Defense Minister on October 9th, 2023, talking about what the one of the tactics of their war would be. I have ordered a complete siege on the Gaza Strip. There will be no electricity, no food, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting human animals, and we act accordingly. So they made no secret of the fact that that was their goal, that that was their intention. Now, obviously, after six months, when you have doctors and nurses from around the world, not just from Gaza, but from Europe and North America and South America and Asia, having been based in Gaza, going to Gaza to try and provide health care, and they have firsthand accounts of babies and young children and adults dying of hunger, mass famine throughout Gaza, a population of 2.2 million people, half of whom are children. That's 1.1 million children, people under the age of 18. They have all kinds of Western healthcare providers and aid organizations documenting that in nurseries, the babies are too malnourished even to cry. They often die immediately after birth or they die stillborn because they're not getting enough nutrition. There are three and four and five-year-old children who are simply wasting away, who are completely emaciated and who are dying simply of hunger because there is no way to get food into Gaza, even though many aid organizations and countries are trying. And that's because, in large part, Israel is making good on what they said they would do, which was prevent food from getting into Gaza. Here from The Guardian today, yet another report has been issued, this one by the World Bank. Quote, World Bank report finds imminent risk of catastrophic famine in the Gaza Strip. Findings come as the UN General Secretary calls on Israel to give unconditional access to Gaza for aid relief. Everyone all over the world knows exactly why there's famine in Gaza. It's because the Israelis are blocking trucks from getting in. You can interview the drivers of these trucks. You can interview the organizations sending them. And they will say the Israelis keep them out for hours and days at a time. What they do let in is a tiny little fraction of what's necessary for the sustenance of the population. There's no doubt in anyone's mind except in the minds of a sector of Israel supporters in the United States who deny fault automatically in every instance when it comes to Israel why this is happening. It's because Israel is using famine and war and hunger and starvation as a weapon of war. 
Here from The Guardian, quote, half the population of the Gaza Strip is at imminent risk of famine as food shortages approach catastrophic levels. For more than a million people, the World Bank has warned. The bank's regular update found that of Gaza's population of 2.3 million, there were 1.1 million in the highest risk category, people in catastrophe, which meant risk of acute malnutrition or death. A further 854,000 people, 38% of the population, were in the next category down, people in emergency, where immediate action is needed to save their lives. The remaining 12% were in the third category, people in crisis. Nobody in Gaza, not a single human being, was placed in the bottom two categories, people merely stressed or people in, in food in, who are food insecure. Quote, Household surveys, or I'm sorry, people who have food security. Not one person in Gaza is in the two best categories. Quote, household surveys reveal alarming trends with virtually all households skipping meals daily and a significant portion of children under two suffering from acute malnutrition, the report said. The World Bank said the projected famine could happen at any time between now and late May and conditions were being exacerbated by a number of factors, including relentless hostilities, meaning... Israel's war in Gaza, widespread damage to infrastructure and restricted humanitarian access, hindering the delivery of essential supplies and services. Now, you notice that a lot of Western media accounts like The Guardian write these reports, and so does the, the World Bank, to exclude any active agent. They say famine is happening. Humanitarian aid is being blocked. They write it on purpose to prevent affirmative declarative statements that Israel is deliberately causing it, but there's no question that that is what's happening. First of all, Israel is the party that is in charge of all of Gaza. Hamas does not govern Gaza and has not since October 8th when Israel started bombing and then Israel invaded. Certainly hasn't for many months. The governing body of Gaza is Israel. It determines who and what gets in and out. It determines who goes where and what goes where. Obviously, there are still Hamas forces fighting against the invading Israeli army on their soil. But what happens in Gaza is determined by the Israelis. So if there's famine in Gaza, if there are blockades of uh, convoys from getting in and out, it's only one reason. It's only one party that governs Gaza. It's not Hamas. It's Israel. Secondly, there was no mass famine in Gaza prior to the Israeli invasion. So trying to blame Hamas for a famine that did not happen until the Israelis arrived is obviously irrational. Thirdly, the Israelis have explicitly said that they intended to use that as a weapon of war. And then fourth, there are endless reports of Israelis blocking aid to Gaza on the grounds that they want the population to starve. Here is France 24 in February of 2024, just last month, here you see the headline, Israeli protesters block aid convoys bound for Gaza. Quote, you might say it's not acceptable to block food and water going in, said one protester, David Rudman, at the Nitsana border post between Israel and Egypt. Quote, but given the situation we're in, it's acceptable, he argued, as the Gaza war, siege, and hostage crisis have continued into the fifth month. Here from the Washington Post, also in February, quote, young Israelis block aid to Gaza while IDF soldiers stand and watch. Quote, it's approaching 1 a.m. Yosef de Brester, 22, is in the thick of planning. He taps out a WhatsApp message to rally more. Quote, we sleep tonight in Karam Shalom and block aid and fuel to Hamas. Do you want to sleep here with us? Shuttles are running throughout the night and day. Before Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th and the war that ensued, Karam Shalom was the main commercial crossing between Israel and Gaza. Today, it's one of just two entry points for life-saving food and medicine to the besieged enclave, where aid agencies say civilians are on the brink of famine. But the Bresser and his three companions, Israelis, are determined to keep any trucks from getting through. And they aren't bothered if innocents suffer. Quote, war is war, de Bresser shrugs. The United States didn't care about civilians when it blew up Hiroshima and Nagasaki, who gives his enemy aid. Now, again, no one's asking these Israelis to give aid, food, water, electricity to the Palestinians. The world is saying that Israel should stop blocking others from wanting to give them food and water. And yet Israel is defying the entire world, as it often does, defying the United States, which is paying for its war, 
providing its weapons and arms that it uses to destroy Gaza, to the point that the United States now actually has to humiliate itself by trying to airdrop aid into Gaza through parachutes because their allies, the Israelis, whose war the United States is paying for and arming, refuses to let even the United States, their main patron, bring aid into, the, in, into Gaza, into the, the population. And the United States is reduced to airdropping aid to the Gazans because they're not allowed to bring aid in directly to Palestinians. Now, one of the things that I think is so important to note, because I see all the time now, Democrats in the United States decrying what Israel is doing, denouncing what Israel is doing, calling Netanyahu all sorts of names. There's often an attempt. I see this all the time from especially more left liberal members of the Democratic Party. When they finally now are willing to denounce Israel, they try and turn it into a left-right issue by emphasizing that this is the fault of the right-wing Israeli government, as though there's some sort of alternative waiting in the wings that would come in and end the war, when in reality, virtually the entire Israeli population is united in support of this war. There is no alternative, some nice center-left alternative to Netanyahu. In fact, Netanyahu's primary opposition, the, the mainstream parties in, in Israel that are Netanyahu's opposition, has joined his war cabinet and continue to remain there. And what they're really doing when they say these things, oh, Netanyahu is evil, Netanyahu is bad, the far-right government of Israel, is they are deliberately obscuring the responsibility for this war that actually rests with the President of the United States, Joe Biden. They're playing a sick political game, and it includes Democrats like Bernie Sanders and AOC. Bernie Sanders, actually, at the start of the war, defended Israel, went on Face the Nation and said, of course I'm opposed to a ceasefire. How do you have a ceasefire when you have to destroy Hamas? And AIPAC publicly thanked him for it. And now they know that they need to assuage the angry left-wing of their party, the people who are on the left but still vote for Democrats. You can question whether they really are leftist or not, but the left wing of the Democratic Party that is angry about this war, they want to hear people like Bernie Sanders and AOC and other Democrats denouncing the war, even though when doing so, they don't actually put blame on the person who's responsible, which is Joe Biden. And the fact that Joe Biden is responsible for the war in Israel is obviously demonstrated by the fact that the United States, under Biden's leadership, is paying for Israel's war, not just through the $4 billion a year that Israel gets every year in American aid, as a result of an aid package that Barack Obama and Joe Biden negotiated and finalized with Benjamin Netanyahu as one of the last acts the Obama administration performed that was in September of 2016 when they agreed to a record-setting $38 billion deal for American taxpayers to transfer to Israel over 10 years, some of which, much of which, has to be spent by buying weapons from Americans' arms dealers, so American elites who own major stock in, arms, in, in the arms industry also benefit. But much of that money doesn't have to be spent on that at all. It's just aid to Israel that they can spend how they want at a time when there are millions of Israelis with a higher standard of living than, Israel, than millions of Americans have. But on top of that, $4 billion every year in aid, every time Israel has a new war with its neighbor, with one of its neighbors, it asks the United States to pay for it and to provide the bombs and the weapons to it that it wants to use to bomb their neighbors. And the United States, in each and every instance, provides that. Joe Biden ran to Benjamin Netanyahu almost immediately after October 7th, and very consistent with Biden's decades-long behavior as being one of Israel's most stalwart defenders, he promised that America would pay for Israel's war, would pay for it, would arm it, above and beyond the $4 billion that we sent to them each year. He immediately demanded $14 billion from Congress for war funding for Israel to pay for its war. And Israeli military officials openly admit that the only reason they're able to carry out this war is because of Joe Biden, because Joe Biden's paying for it, because Joe Biden is arming it. Without that, they would not be able to carry out this war. Here from the Jewish News Syndicate in late November, the headline, Biden is the primary obstacle to Israeli victory. They're essentially, they're saying that the 
that somehow Joe Biden uh, is the obstacle to Israeli victory. And yet, within the article, it says this, quote, Israel's dependence on the United States was stated bluntly by retired IDF Major General Yitzhak Brick in an interview earlier this week. This is what General Brick said, quote, all of our missiles, the ammunition, the precision-guided bombs, the airplanes and bombs, it's all from the United States. Everything that the Israelis are using to bomb Gaza to destroy its civilian infrastructure, 70% of residential buildings in Gaza are either destroyed or crippled. The water system, the sewer system are irreparably damaged, if not destroyed. Even when, at some point when the war ends, there's, as Jared Kushner said this week, when asked whether or not he thinks that what would happen once the war ends, he basically said, ah, who cares? You can move the Palestinians out of Gaza. You can build really expensive real estate on the, with, on the sea with really nice water views. He's like, but it really doesn't matter if you let the Palestinians go back or not because there's basically nothing of Gaza left. And at least about that, Jared Kushner is right. The Israelis, with the aid of the United States, the crucial aid of the United States, have destroyed Gaza, but all of the weapons that they've used have been provided by the United States. The general went on, quote, the minute they turn off the tap, you can't keep fighting. You have no capability. Everyone understands that we can't fight this war without the United States, period. Now, in the United States, a lot of Democrats who understand that Joe Biden's support for the war in Gaza is a real political risk for him. Try and convince Americans that, oh, actually, he's doing so much to pressure Netanyahu. He's doing so much to restrain the Israelis. They constantly leak to Politico and places like it, to rags that are like Politico that just anonymously quote any White House official that wants to be quoted anonymously. Oh, Biden is fed up with Netanyahu. He's so frustrated with Netanyahu. He's so angry with him. And of course, the leverage rests entirely with Joe Biden in the United States because without the United States providing weapons and money, this war could not be fought. And that's not my saying that. That's a top-level retired IDF general saying that. In fact, he said the minute they turn off the tap, meaning the minute the United States says we're not going to keep paying for your war, you can't keep fighting. We have no capability. Everyone understands that we can't fight this war without the United States. Everyone understands that we can't fight this war without the United States. I think when he says everyone understands, he doesn't realize that there are a lot of Israel supporters in the United States, I don't think he realizes how propagandized they are, who believe, oh, Joe Biden's not really doing any, anything for Israel. Israel could easily fight this war on its own. They could not fight this war on their own. They don't have the capabilities to fight the war on this own. They need the United States to do so. And the other reason it's going on for it six months is because you have the United States, the richest and most powerful country in the world, standing behind Israel, continuously saying up till today that not only will the U.S. continue to finance and arm Israel's war, but will do so with no conditions of any kind. Now, the White House did get to a certain point where it seemed like they were at least pretending to impose a condition on Israel. They were drawing what was called a red line, namely that the Biden White House was supposedly telling Israel that it was not going to tolerate Israel invading and bombing the refugee camp in Rafah, which is where more than a million Palestinians have now congregated, one of the only places in Gaza that they can be safe, although the Israelis have attacked that refugee camp several times before. And here in Politico, in, uh, on March 10th, the headline was, Biden warns of a red line for Israel over Rafah. So it seemed like, at least in terms of what the Biden White House wanted the media to convey to Americans, that Joe Biden was finally setting a condition on what the Israelis could do, namely this safe space for Palestinian civilians, the only place they can be in, in this refugee camp, is a bridge too far for us. We will not let you 
go there and invade there because it will kill far too many Palestinian civilians. On top of the Palestinian civilians, the massive tragic number you've already killed. And then under that it says Cy Cyprus aid ship gets ready to open humanitarian sea corridor to, to Gaza. And here is the news report from Politico last month, or, or just 10 days ago, quote, U.S. President Joe Biden warned the Israeli government against a further intensification of bloodshed in the Gaza Strip as worries grow over the humanitarian disaster in the enclave. Quote, we cannot have another 30,000 more Palestinians dead, Biden said in an interview with MSNBC on Saturday. Asked whether an invasion of Rafah in the south of Gaza on the border with Egypt was a red line, Biden replied in the affirmative, it is a red line. It's a red line. Now, that is presidential talk for this isn't something that we're only, that we're, this isn't something that we're just against. This is something we will not allow. We will not tolerate. We will not permit. So Biden called that a red line, meaning this is something that the Israelis cannot cross. One of the things that Barack Obama did that provoked the most criticism from the American media was when he declared what he called a red line for Bashar al-Assad in Syria, which was the use of chemical weapons. And when the media began reporting that, Saddam, that, that, that uh, Bashar al-Assad had in fact used chemical weapons against various factions in Syria against whom he was fighting, meaning he had crossed the red line that President Obama set, and there's a lot of people who dispute whether that report, those reports are actually valid, but the White House, the Obama White House, accepted that the Assad government had used chemical weapons as part of that war that the United States was involved with. Even though President Biden had, uh, Obama had said that's a red line, he did essentially nothing once they accepted the reports that the Syrians had used chemical weapons. But in general, it's considered a major blow to presidential credibility for the president or the White House to declare that something is a red line and then have a country cross it with absolutely no consequences. And yet, unsurprisingly, I think, we learn that the Netanyahu government is being very clear that they have absolutely no intention of observing Biden's, quote, red line. They don't care in the slightest. Just like they won't allow the United States to bring in humanitarian aid through American trucks and force the Americans in front of the world to suffer one of the gravest humiliations the American government has had to suffer in airdropping aid to a group of people because their own ally refuses to allow them in to provide aid. Now the Netanyahu government is very ready to humiliate the Biden White House again by saying we don't care about the American red line. Even though the United States is paying for our war and arming us, and even though it will continue to do so, we're not going to limit ourselves to what the Biden administration tells us we can and can't do. Here from Politico, Netanyahu vows to defy Biden's red line. On Rafa, Israeli Prime Minister insists his priority is to prevent another terror attack like the October 7 Hamas raid. The article states, quote, when asked Sunday whether Israeli forces would move into Rafa, Netanyahu replied, quote, we'll go there. We're not going to leave them. You know, I have a red line. You know what the red line is? That October 7th doesn't happen again. Never happens again. So Netanyahu recognizes that Biden set a red line. And he said, I don't care what the red line is. We're going to go there. We're going to go do exactly what Joe Biden said we can't do. I have my own red line, which matters more. Now, if it were the case that the Israelis were fighting this war independently, that if they weren't a dependent on the United States and the American people, if the American people weren't forced to pay for their war and pay for their weapons, there would still be international conventions and institutions to which the Israelis would be accountable. There's things like the Geneva Conventions and the laws of war that were implemented after World War II to prevent things like the Holocaust and war crimes and collective punishment from happening again. But at least you can make the case that there's no reason why the Israeli government should take orders from the United States. It's their war and they ought to fight it how they choose to fight it. The problem is that's not the reality. Israel is anything but independent. Israel is completely dependent on the United States for fighting this war. And so if the United States says this is a 
red line for us strategically because we believe that if you do this, we'll, you'll create huge amounts of problems for our national security. Or this is a red line for us ethically or morally that we will not support and don't want to be associated with in front of the world the killing of thousands more Palestinian civilians, children and women and, and innocent men. And the Israelis just turn around and say, we don't give the slightest uh, concern for what your red lines are. Any country with dignity, any political leader with any dignity would have to then follow through and say, well, if you're going to cross our red line, we're not going to pay for your war anymore. This is so basic. If your child is financially dependent on you, it means you get to set the rules. Once they're financially dependent and couldn't live on their own and support themselves as adults, then they can make their own rules about how they live their lives. But until that happens, when you're still paying their bills, as a parent, you have the right to set rules for what you want to support. And the United States has every right, in fact, every obligation, if it's paying for Israel's war and arming Israel's war, to say there are certain things with which we don't want to be associated. And the Biden administration said that. The White House said that. Invading the Rafah refugee camp is a red line for us. And now you have the Israelis saying, we don't care about your red lines. Netanyahu saying, we're going to ignore your red line. So the only solution is an obvious one, which is that the United States would have to say to the Israelis, that comes next, we're not going to pay for your war anymore then. We're not going to arm your war anymore. You think that's what Joe Biden is doing? Here's what he's doing instead from the New York Times on March 12th. The White House denies that Joe Biden has ever set any, quote, red lines for the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza. The Biden administration repeated its warning that Israel should not attack the city of Rafah, the southernmost city in the enclave, without protections for more than a million people there. Quote, the president didn't make any declarations or pronouncements or announcements, said Jake Sullivan, the president's national security advisor, referring to an interview Mr. Biden gave over the weekend in which he was asked whether he had a red line Israel should not cross in its prosecution of the war. Now, we just showed you that on that MSNBC interview, Biden was asked, is this a red line for the United States that Israel can't enter the Rafa camp? And Biden said, absolutely, it's a red line. There you see it. Asked whether an invasion of Rafa in the south of Gaza uh, uh, on the border with Egypt was a red line. Biden replied in the affirmative. It's a red line. And now you have the New York Times. White House denies that Biden has set a red line. So this happens all the time. Joe Biden goes on television. He makes some kind of a statement. Maybe he doesn't intend to. Maybe he doesn't know what he's saying. And then the White House has to pretend that he never said it. Because obviously Joe Biden is not setting White House policy. This is proof of that. But what it's also proof of is the country that's really in charge, even though you would think the United States being a much bigger country, a much larger country, a much more powerful country, a much richer country, a country that funds Israel, funds its military, funds its wars, you would think the United States would be the country in charge so that if the United States says this is a red line, you cannot cross, Israel wouldn't be able to cross it, at least not without consequences. And yet, everybody knows that's not how things work when it comes to the United States and Israel. The country that dictates how things work is the dependent country, which is Israel. And Netanyahu has been heard on tape talking before about how easy it is to provoke the American public to side with this foreign country, Israel, over their own country, over their own government. And they believe, with good reason, that the American public will at least the, the parts that wield a lot of power, political and financial power in, in Washington, will be on the side of Israel over the United States, including a lot of people who define themselves as being America first, but who believe that for some reason the money that the United States has that American taxpayers generate should not be used at home, but should instead be sent to Israel to pay for their war and their military instead of being used at home to improve the lives of American citizens. And so you have this bizarre situation where Joe Biden has now set a red line that the Netanyahu government has mocked and laughed at. And instead of doing anything about it, Joe Biden is now denying that they ever said, the White House is now denying that Joe Biden ever set a red line 
And so not only will Israel be able to continue to block food from entering Gaza, not only will they be able to continue and expand the mass famine, the world will stand by and watch, not hundreds or thousands, but tens of thousands of Palestinians die of famine. Obviously, children who suffer malnutrition on this level of severity and duration never really recover. Their growth is interrupted. Their development is impeded in ways that are irrevocable. To say nothing of the psychological destruction of having the entire society in which you live completely destroyed by the most powerful bombs that the world knows. But now the one place in Gaza where refugees are huddled is about to be invaded very shortly after the, the Biden White House said this is a red line that is off limits and whatever else you want, want to say about the war, and obviously we have made our own perspective of this very clear over many months and we know there are people in our audience who don't see it that way, the key point that has to be understood, that has to be acknowledged is that this is an American war. This is Joe Biden's war and whatever happens in Israel or more accurately in Gaza by Israel over the last six months and however many months more this lasts is something that goes directly on Joe Biden's ledger, on his legacy. As the Israeli general said, the minute they cut us off, the war ends. We can only fight this war because the Biden administration is giving us the money and the weapons to do so. And that has all kinds of moral and ethical implications, but it has great strategic implications for the United States as well because Obviously, if the Israelis know that and the Palestinians know that, the entire world understands, and I promise you they do, that what is happening in Gaza is not only an Israeli war, but it's an American war. And it's crucial to understand that it's Joe Biden's war as well.